there was something I wanted to go over in Malachi 2 that I thought might benefit anyone watching this. So why don't we check it out together? Malachi 2, you have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, how have we wearied him by saying everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord and he delights in them or by asking, where is the God of justice? And again, this is God speaking to his people saying they are saying this and we're still doing that. How many times has a believer said, how come all these bad people are doing so well for themselves? And I'm struggling to make ends meet and to feed my kids. Or this one, where is the God of justice? Let's get a couple things real clear. Just because someone is doing well for themselves, it does not mean that they are right in the eyes of God. That's including believers that are doing really well. The Joel Osteens of the world who are like trillionaires and have jets and islands and stuff. Just because they have all that wealth, it does not mean that they're doing what God wants them to do. In fact, it's probably the exact opposite of it, actually. Because for the most part, money and possessions lead you away from God. There are very few people in scripture who are wealthy and were able to maintain a strong foundation and relationship with our Father in Heaven. That is because worldly possessions just rip you away from all the things that are holy. So being rich is not necessarily a good thing. But the second part, and most important, is where is the God of justice? Because usually when someone says to me, why does God allow suffering? It's not a non-believer. Usually when people ask that, it's believers in the church. And unfortunately, they ask these questions because they haven't been taught about the God of the Bible. They've been taught about the God of the world. You may think they're one and the same, but they're not. And let's get something very clear here. God does not allow suffering. So I just want you to get that out of your head. Because if everybody actually did what God asked us to do in the Bible, it'd be a world full of Jesuses. The world would be perfect and there would be no suffering if everyone would just do what God asked. But even believers don't do what God asked. The Jews don't do what God asked, neither do the Muslims, neither do the Christians. Nobody does what God asked. This is 2nd Ezra chapter 3. It was included in the 1611 KJV and it says this, You may indeed find individuals who have kept your commandments, but nations you will not find. Now, 2nd Esdras is rejected by the Christians now because it points to obedience, and 2nd Esdras is rejected by the Jews because it points to the Messiah. I, however, think it's a fantastic book that everyone should read. But how true are those words written thousands of years ago? You may indeed find one person in a nation who is doing what you asked, but a whole nation of people doing it, you won't find. Literally says it in scripture, and that's exactly what we see today. People have a really bad habit of thinking they're doing what God asked and then just not actually doing what he asked. You don't have to take my word for it. Just read your Bible. Not even the Apocrypha. Just the 66 books is all you need to figure that out for yourself. But the point remains, God did not allow suffering. Okay, it's people that create suffering. If you read your Bible, you'll just see a pattern over and over and over again where people say, nah, thanks God, I don't really want to do what you asked. And that is what leads to suffering. And I find it really sad that a believer can't answer a basic question like that. Now, as far as answering these questions to atheists, who cares what they believe? They, they're not believers. They don't care. We don't have to explain these types of things to them because... They're not going to believe it or care about it anyways. And speaking as someone who was once a non-believer, there's no amount of arguing that's going to make those people see reason. It took the Most High Himself to wake me up out of my stupor and make me become a believer. It was not a human being that made me a believer in the Most High God and His Son Yeshua HaMashiach. It was the Most High Himself. So because of that reason, I'm not called to non-believers. I can't help them. I don't know how it's not in my wheelhouse. It took the most high himself to wake me up. And I imagine for most of these people, that's the only thing that would do the trick. 
So maybe if you're called to non-believers, you need to figure out how to answer these questions for them or help them see reason. But I am called to believers. I'm called to help you understand the scriptures, the whole Bible, not just parts of it, all of it in context. I'm called to help you deepen your relationship with the Most High by walking in the footsteps of His Son, our Messiah. And if you really believe the scriptures, then when it comes to answering questions like, why does God allow this or that? Or why did this bad thing happen in the Old Testament? You should realize that there is a plausible explanation for it, even if you don't understand it. And consider verses like Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. So don't worry about non-believers that are prospering. I can guarantee you that whatever they have in this life is not as good as what you're going to get in the next life. And don't worry about answering questions like, why does God allow suffering when scripture tells you that answer?